Chicago AA Education KC. This is our quarter one programming. Um, we have a panelist today um, to talk about acoustical design in the classroom. Um, I'm Kaisa Heinitz. I'm an architect at SMNGA and I'm a co-chair for the Education KC. Um, and we're excited about the talk today. We have an audiologist, we have a project architect who works on educational design, and then we have an acoustical consultant. Um, we can go to the next slide. Before we begin, I just want to acknowledge all of our sponsors that are helping the AIA and all of our educational programming happen. So thank you, everyone. And the next slide, our education knowledge committee. So we're a small group of architects that are interested in educational design and about um, using design to improve um, space planning and growth and learning. And so we're excited that you're here. If you're interested in joining us, we do have um, our quarterly meeting coming up next week on April 5th. And then we have them once a quarter, we have July 5th, October 4th. We also have some events and tours that will be coming up. If you go to the AA website, we have all of that information there. All right, and I'll introduce you to our presenters here. Um, Mike, if you go to the next slide. Mike Schwinnenhammer is an architect with 27 years of design experience on multiple types of projects, both domestic and international. He's a senior design architect and school planner at Epstein UN Architects, where he works in the learning environment studio, focusing on primary K through 12 projects. Our second presenter, Alejandra Uwalari, is a doctor in a bilingual audiologist practicing in Chicago. She has over 20 years of experience in this field. And throughout her career, she's worked with pediatric and adult populations, supporting the needs of students and teachers with hearing loss. From 2018 to 2021, Dr. Uwalari was a board member at Child's Voice, a school for children with hearing loss. And then we have Laura Brill. Laura Brill is an acoustic consultant at Threshold Acoustics in Chicago, where she's been since 2017. And her work focuses on the design of places where we gather to learn, share wisdom, and pass along culture. She received a Master of Science in Architectural Engineering from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, where she led a graduate student research um, project managing large-scale measurement campaign of 220 K through 12 classrooms where they measured the effect of the built environment on student achievement. And Laura will be sharing some of that on her presentation here. Um, before we get started with the presentation, if you have questions throughout the presentation, you can put them in the Q&A and we'll have a little bit of time at the end to talk through your questions. All right, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Kaisa. Could you help us turning on the captions? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Alejandra. I wasn't sure how to do that. I'll give it just a minute here so we can get those to turn on. I'm actually going to see Madison if you're able to turn on captions. Okay. Yes, I am working behind the scenes to get those up. Sorry. Okay. Madison, sorry any point, I'll, I'll start, but if at any point you need to interrupt me. Mike, could you please wait until the captions are sure. on? Mike, go ahead and start because um, I'm going to have to go on the back and fix this. Sorry, in advance. Okay. Sorry from that. Okay. Um, thank you, Kaisa, and thank you to everyone for taking the time to join us today for what I feel can often be an overlooked area of school design, and that's the acoustical design in the classrooms. Um, as we design more equitable and inclusive learning environments, uh, we should also look at more than just the conditions uh, that students might have that are visible. A couple of years ago, a couple of years ago, I was having a conversation with Dr. Lori and some of her colleagues. Uh, they, they, they've been in a new school. They're visiting some students with hearing loss that were transitioning to a new school. And when I was talking with them, they were commenting on how beautiful the classrooms were. Um, these classrooms were nothing like what they had. And from what they described, there was nothing like what I had either when I was younger. Um, the space looked really cool. There was polished concrete floors, exposed structure. The rooms were bright and open with lots of daylighting and views to the exterior. Even the school wasn't one of my projects. 
as an architect and a designer, I felt a sense of pride thinking that, yeah, this is what we do. We create environments that people want to be in. Um, my did my head did start to drop though as we continue as they continue the review classrooms, the hard concrete floors, all the glass, um, the exposed structure with no acoustic ceilings, all contributed to horrible acoustics in the classrooms. The children with hearing loss were having a more difficult time than usual hearing what was happening in the classrooms, um, but they weren't the only ones affected. Teachers and other students were going home exhausted, some with bad headaches, um, and, and it really was. Um, it was to blame. Poor acoustics affect more than just students hearing. Uh, a Harvard study showed that the effects of the classroom space with poor acoustics can be, uh, in addition to hearing loss, can be annoyance, uh, sleep disturbance, stress, hypertension, and lower ac academic performance. After hearing this, I wanted a chance to talk with some experts in their respective fields to find out more about the effects of acoustics in schools. Um, so thank you to Kaisa, AIH Chicago's Education KC for helping us put this together. Um, really appreciate the ability to bring in um, an audiologist and an acoustic designer to, to talk about this. So also thank you to Alejandra and Laura. Uh, first started planning. Uh, this presentation, we discussed many of the various areas of schools where acoustical design should be considered. Um, obviously, the auditorium and music, music classrooms, but also the library, cafeterias, commons. But since we're limited to just an hour with you today, we decided to focus on where students spend the majority of the time when school, and that's the classroom. And quite frankly, the classrooms usually aren't at the top of the list for acoustical consideration. Um, today, we'll also be focusing on classrooms in the K-12 facilities. Um, during Alejandro's portion of the presentation, you'll, you'll understand that a little bit better. Um, with the learning objectives after today's presentation, you should be able to identify how changes to modern learning have created new listening challenges for users. You should be able to describe how noise affects students' ability to focus and learn in a modern classroom setting. And you should also be able to identify key factors in the classroom, acoustic standards, and ways to adhere through architectural and building systems design choices. Uh, we want you to be able to walk away today with a better understanding of the effect of noise in the classroom so you can ad advocate for better acoustical design with your project teams and your clients. So let's start off by looking at some of some of the ways that the changes in education delivery um, could students' ability to hear and focus in the classroom. Um, historically, classrooms look like this. Students sitting at their desks, desks in a row, desks at one point were even bolted to the floors or heavy desks and all facing the front of the classroom. At the front of the classroom, there would be a chalkboard with the teacher standing at the center of everyone's attention. Um, the teacher then doles out facts, dates, multiplication tables, all things that the students would be required to memorize and recall come test day. Um, there was typically one source of speech and that was the class, the teacher in the classroom. If a student had an issue hearing the teacher, they would just be told to move to the front of the front of the room so they could be closer to the source. But what happens when there isn't a clear front of the classroom? With modern learning, the front of the room isn't always the front of the room. Um, the teacher isn't always the center of attention. Education focus has shifted from skills, from the skills of remembering, understanding, and applying to the skills of analyzing, evaluating, creating, um, students are more active and participatory in, in their learning. They learn more through human environment interaction than through the single-sided teaching that was seen during traditional learning. When designing classrooms for modern learning, we are aiming to create more highly flexible spaces. There will be typically be whiteboards and presentation technology, such as a smart board or display screen located on one wall, um, which, which becomes the, that primary teaching wall. But the intent is, the intent of the design is to provide that flexibility uh, in a classroom such as the one shown here, a variety of teaching modality, modalities can be supported. Um, furniture is now designed to be lighter and easier, uh, so, so students can quickly rearrange it to different configurations, pulling it together uh, for group work, pulling it apart for individual work. This flexibility also allows for different teaching methods to be implemented to accommodate the different ways that students are learning. Um, we know that not all students learn the same way, so now the teacher can go around the classroom and meet with the different students. With the group setting, 
Um, students get a chance to interact directly with other classmates, which complicates their ability to hear. Though the students represented by the blue dots here are trying to have a conversation with each other, their ears are picking up the conversation, other conversations that are happening in the room. In a class of 24, 28 students, this could mean there are four to six groups of kids talking at one time. And everyone should at some point walk into either a first grade classroom or even a 12th grade classroom and experience what this is like when all of them are talking. Uh, the Lombard effect explains how when in the presence of background noise, people tend to talk louder. Uh, their volume goes up, pitch goes up, rate goes up. Also, they can be heard clearer. And of course, as they talk louder, other people are talking louder. Um, you've probably experienced this yourself uh, at a restaurant or at a party. Um, so where we once had a single source teaching method, we now have multiple sources for voices and for noise that are competing for the listener's attention. This can make it more difficult for students to focus on the intended source and to distinguish it from background noises. Another component of modern learning that we look to incorporate into our designs is transparency. On the exterior walls, transparency, glass, um, provides views to the outside world and provides daylighting into the classroom. Studies have shown that both of these are very beneficial to students' engagement and learning. On the interior of the space, using glass, we can open up lines of sight to adjacent collaboration spaces, making learning more communal. It also encourages students to collaborate, to also put that education or learning on display. Um, an added benefit of the transparency is also the uh, passive and active supervision that teachers can have from the classroom into these collaboration spaces and even as corridors. As Laura will talk about later, as Laura will talk about later, though, this increase in the amount of glazing in the classroom will have an impact on the acoustics in the classroom. Um, and based on when we start a design for a new school, we'll look at the teaching methods that they're going to use, and often we'll add connectivity into our designs. Um, in, in this example, you can see in the background on the left side, there's an, an operable partition that's connecting this classroom to the adjacent classroom um, for co-teaching. In the foreground, there's a large open uh, operable partition there that connects this classroom to the collaborative space. Um, these, these, oops, sorry. Uh, these partitions are great and add uh, great flexibility throughout the day uh, and also even allow adapt adaptation of the space over the years. Um, we expect students to be able to work in groups today. This, that connectivity gives open access to the common areas. Um, the space and the furniture are designed to accommodate multiple groups talking, uh, multiple size groups. Uh, so multiple groups are talking at the same time in this area as events are happening in the classroom too. But back to our blue dot student here um, that's sitting at their desk in the classroom. They're now being distracted by even more conversations, activities, and, and just plain noise. Uh, though the conversations aren't directed at them, their ears are still picking them up, and, it's, and they're forced to distinguish between what is background noise and, and what they're trying to hear. Oops. Um, so now Alejandra is going to talk to us and, and explain to us what the effects of noise are for the students. Um, thank you so much, Michael, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today. My name is Alejandra Ulari. I'm an audiologist. Um, I've been practicing for 20 years, and I've been supporting students and teachers with hearing loss in their different um, learning environments. So I'm super excited to be here, and, um, and I'm grateful for all your interest in making um, classroom acoustics um, more optimal for for all the users. So um, I thought we'll start by listing the, the negative effects that bad classroom acoustics have on the learning experience. So they can impact reading comprehension, auditory and visual attention, short-term memory, behavior, and social skills. And basically that's because as listening tasks become more complex, there is a higher demand on cognitive resources. In other words, if listening requires a lot of effort, there is less resources available to perform other cognitive tasks, such as processing the information, storing the information, so you can recall the information at a later time. Next slide, please. 
we know that young children are more vulnerable than adults, and that's because their central auditory pathways are not fully developed until adolescence. So you can see in this graph, everything that is inside the blue circle, that's your peripheral hearing or auditory system, that snail looking organ, that's your cochlea. And basically we are born with adult size cochlea. So our cochleas are not gonna change um, throughout our lifespan. However, everything that is inside the pink circle, that's your central auditory pathways. And they're gonna continue to mature until you reach adolescence. And basically the, the central auditory pathways are taking the information up to the cortex so the brain can process this information and, and make out what people are saying or what the sounds represent. So for children, it's really hard to listen in noise because when there is a lot of noise, they don't have the linguistic experience or the context in order to fill in, fill in the gaps like we do as adults. So when we are in crowded situations, loud places, restaurants, and so on, if we cannot hear everything that is being said to us, if we know the context, we know the speaker, and obviously our vocabulary is significantly um, greater than in a child, um, we can do a lot of guessing and filling in the gaps. And if we know the topic, we can we can do that quite well. But for children, that is that's a very difficult task, exactly because of the same reasons. They lack they lack the linguistic experience, they lack the context, and so on. And also children get easily distracted by noise. So even though all children, all students are um, um, benefit from good acoustics, there is a group of children that are at risk of missing out on the learning experience because of different different uh, because of different um, situations. So, for instance, younger children; those would be younger than fifteen years of age. Children with hearing loss children with language or articulation disorders, children with learning difficulties and dyslexia. Dyslexia is the most common learning disability that um, is diagnosed. Children with developmental delays, children with attention deficits, and children who are English language, um, who are learning English as a second language. So for them, noise can be very intrusive and can have a, a really, um, negative impact on that learning experience. So uh, how many kids are we talking about? So the CDC says um, estimates that about 18% of children between three and 17 years of age have some kind of developmental delay. And the CDC groups different disorders um, under the same umbrella um, as a developmental delay. So we're talking about children with language disorders, learning disorders, attention deficit, um, autism di uh, spectrum disorders, intellectual disability, and others. The National Center for Education and Statistics, they report that approximately in the, in the school year 2020 to 2021, approximately 15% of the students between three and 21 years of age received um, special education services in the school system. So you can see that these statistics, statistics are pretty close. So then we add, we have to also mention children with hearing loss. We estimate that about 15% of children in, in school age, so six to 19 years of age, have some degree of hearing losses. Um, I, I divided uh, children with hearing loss in two groups for the purpose of this presentation. And the first group have children, the first, I'm sorry, the first group has children that have minimal hearing losses, temporary hearing losses. These, these hearing losses are usually due to middle ear infections and they fluctuate. And then we have children with auditory central processing disorders. In the next group, I put the children with permanent hearing losses. So those children have a diagnosis. Most likely they were some kind of hearing technology such as hearing aids, cochlear implants, bone anchor hearing aids. The reason why I divided these groups is because the bottom group, those children with permanent hearing losses, 
as I said, they have a diagnosis, they wear hearing aids. And for these children, background noise and distance, uh, those are really, really uh, tough situations because um, even though they wear uh, hearing technology, hearing technology is not equal to normal hearing. So for them, listening in background noise and listening at a distance can be a very difficult task. Luckily, these children in many school systems can benefit or can have access to FM systems. So the teacher wears a receiver such as the one in the picture, and then the child wears a, I'm sorry, the teacher wears a transmitter, and then the child wears a receiver. So that means that whatever the teacher is speaking into the transmitter is sent to the child's receiver. And that way we try to overcome distance and background noise because they can be so intrusive in the learning experience. However, I wanted to highlight the children in the first group, those children with minimal hearing losses, temporary hearing losses, and auditory central processing disorders, because many of these children might not have a diagnosis. Because they're, 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 they have a minimal hearing loss, it might, it might have not been picked up yet. If they have a fluctuating hearing loss, but when they had the hearing screening, they didn't have middle ear fluid, so they passed the screening. But then they get a middle ear, a middle ear fluid or uh, middle ear infections, and now their hearing is down. And children with auditory processing disorders, these children might pass the hearing screening at school because because their condition is not related to their hearing thresholds. It's more related to how they process sound. So these children are really going to have a tough time in background noise, especially when nobody knows that they are dealing with some degree of hearing loss. And then we add those children that are learning English as a second language. So this is from the National Center of Education um, Statistics, and they estimate that nationally, 10% of those children in, in the school system are learning English as a second language. But in Illinois, that's actually 12.3%. And in places in states like Texas, it's nearly 20%. So again, we're not talking about a few, few children. We're talking about between 10 and 20% of children who are benefit, who are learning English as a second language. Um, Kaisa was going to help us. We have all these statistics. I got them from this um, annual report. So we're going to put the link in the chat. So if any of you are interested in the in this data, you can download the, the report. And those are in already in the chat. Awesome. Thank you, Kaisa. Yep. And so if we talk about, if we do... Um, a conservative estimate. And we take the 15% from the National Center of Education um, Statistics instead of the 18% from the CDC. And we take 10% from the national average of English language learners. We're talking about 25% of children in the school system. If we take Texas as an estimate, we're talking about nearly 35%. So that means that one in three or one in four children will experience less than optimal opportunity for learning if we don't pay attention to classroom acoustics. If the, if the learning environment is a noisy place where, where they have to deal with background noise and reverberation. Next slide, please. So having said that, I wanted to highlight these are the, the they are the reason why we really need to advocate for, um, for better acoustics in the classrooms, advocate for, um, for those of us working in the field, you know, making these learning environments more conducive of learning, more conducive of, of education. And that means decreasing background noise levels and reverberation. So I wanted to walk you through these four main aspects that we pay attention to. So that would be noise, signal to noise ratio, reverberation, and distance. So noise, um, noise refers to an 
auditory disturbance from what the listener is interested in. And noise can be external or internal. Internal means, means the noise that comes from the hallways, from the classroom next door, and also from, from the children themselves. And then you can have external noise that comes from, um, from traffic noise, maybe a playground outside the classroom, and so on. Um, we know that the HVAC systems are the greater contributors of background noise. Signal to noise ratio refers to the difference between the intensity of the signal of interest, so that would be the teacher or classmates, and the background noise level. And signal to noise ratio is a very, very important factor when it comes to speech understanding or speech recognition. Reverberation, that a uh, reverberation occurs when sounds hit different surfaces causing reflections and then those reflections stay persistent in, the, in a given space. Those initial reflections that happen in the first 50 to 60 milliseconds can be actually quite beneficial because they can enhance the speech. They can arrive at the, at the listener's ear quite at the same time. But late reflections and multiple reflections, they have the opposite effect. They smear speech and increase background noise. So we end up with an effective signal and effective noise. Effective signal is the direct input, so the direct um, sound from the teacher, plus those early reflections, that's the best. And that's very useful energy for the listener. But you have also effective noise, which means that you have late reflections that plus additional background noise, and that's detrimental for the listening ex for the listener experience. So um, I wanted to highlight that children really, really struggle to hear in background noise, but they have an even harder time when there is background noise and reverberation. So multiple studies have shown, and the literature the literature has shown that noise and reverberation, you know, makes the listening experience significantly harder. Um, and then that takes us to distance and distance is it's it's extremely important because that that's the um, that's what separates the listener and the speaker. So every time uh, you increase the distance, you decrease the intensity. So there is a law that says um, the inverse square law that says that every time you double the distance, you reduce the, the intensity by six decibels. Um, Classrooms are not free fields, but, but it's important to understand that every time you increase, increase the distance, you, redo, you decrease the intensity. You also, every time you increase the distance, you increase the background noise in between the listener and the speaker. And every time you increase the distance, you decrease high frequency consonant information. And this is extremely important for speech understanding because a lot of the consonants, uh, such as s, sh, f, those consonants are high frequency sounds. So when you increase distance, you're decreasing high frequency sounds. And those high frequency sounds that correspond to consonants is exactly what gives meaning to what we say. If you cannot hear consonants and you can only hear vowel information, which is mostly low frequency information, it turns out that you're hearing wah, 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 because you're missing all those consonants that actually gives meaning to what we say. I don't know if many of you know um, Older adults that have high frequency, they, they tend to have mostly high frequency hearing losses. They usually say that, oh, I can hear people mumble. And the reason why is because they hear people talking, they hear that low frequency information, but they're missing all those high frequency consonants. So they are missing on what people, they cannot make out what people say. So consonant inf high frequency information is extremely important for speech discrimination. And that leads me to my favorite slide because um, 
we really need to make sure the difference between the signal of interest and the noise is at least 15 decibels. And then technically we can expect 100% speech recognition, meaning that the, per the, the person has enough acoustical information to understand what they are hearing. Remember, it's not about hearing, it's about understanding what you hear. And for young children, this is a complex task because their auditory pathways are still developing. If you, so if the signal is 15 dB above the noise, then you have a, you technically you have 100% of speech recognition. If the signal is at equal level or equal intensity as the noise, then your speech recognition drops to 50%. And then remember that children don't have linguistic experience and context and phonological knowledge to be able to fill in the gaps and make up for that 50% that is missing. And then if the noise is higher than the speech, then the, back, the speech understanding drops to 0%. So with that, I want to say this is why it, this is why it is so important to pay attention to um, classroom acoustics, because for children spend 60 to 75% of the time do, in listening activities during the school day. And remember, good classroom acoustics benefit all students, not only the 25 to 35% of students are considered at risk. So if you have not met or worked with an educational audiologist, they are, um, their training and experience allows them to um, assess classroom acoustics, measure background noise levels and reverberation times, and determine that the impact these factors have on the student's ability to access auditory information. So they can be great um, team members in, in the design process. And usually they, they work with the school district or they're employed by the school or the school district. So um, you have to um, find them within the, the system you're working with. So I thought I'll leave you with a couple of tips. Team up with them. So they are gonna be great advocates to help you um, to help you, you know, get the message across why acoustics, classroom acoustics are so important and why so many children could be left behind if we don't pay attention to background noise within the listening and the learning experience. So with that, I want to pass it on to Laura, who is going to talk about um, acoustic best practices. And I'm so looking forward to hear what she has to say. Thanks, Alejandra. Um, so I am an acoustics consultant um, here in Chicago at uh, Threshold Acoustics, um, but my, my background in grad school, um, where I, I have a master's of architectural engineering with an emphasis in acoustics, and while I was in graduate school, I had a phenomenal opportunity to work on a, a U.S. Environmental Protection Agency funded study um, where we were studying the effect of indoor environmental conditions excuse me, indoor environmental conditions on student achievement. And so I focused on the acoustic aspects um, of that indoor environment and managed the in situ measurements of 220 K through 12 classrooms. Um, and so I'm, I'm bringing some of that experience here um, as well as my experience as a practicing acoustician. Uh, so let's get into some of uh, the classroom acoustics aspects here. Uh, if we'll go to the next slide, thank you. So when talking about classroom acoustics, I, I really like to start with the American National Standard uh, ANSI ASA S12.60. Um, the most recent um, uh, edition was published in 2010. We're actually working on a new revision now. Um, I'm part of that committee that is, that is working on that. Um, but it is a it provides a acoustical performance criteria for and design requirements and guidelines for schools. And the standard was instituted to create appropriate environments for listening comprehension, 
Um, and the best balance, the best environments balance background noise and reverberation time to improve speech intelligibility. So these are things that that we're building on from Alejandra's um, portion of the presentation, but these are really important. And so ANSI, um, we'll start with, with the background noise level portion of it. Uh, if we'll go to the next slide, Mike. Thank you. So um, ANSI says that uh, the background noise level uh, is the sound in a furnished, unoccupied learning space, and it includes sounds from outdoor sources and uh, building services and utilities, but it excludes sound generated by people within the building or sound generated by temporary or permanent instructional equipment. Um, one thing that, that I saw in our classroom measurements and continue to see today um, are more and more kind of laptop carts, uh, you know, it used to have been like project, uh, not projector, but like overhead projectors, those could have been loud. Now it's more uh, projector equipment. So anything that's used for instructional is not included in this minimum, um, but is something that we should consider as well. So the background noise level that ANSI specifies um, at its most basic level for typically sized classrooms is a 35 dBA maximum. So decibels are the measure of sound pressure level and a weighted sound pressure level or DBA is a frequency weighting that roughly approximates how the, how the human ear hears different frequency components of the sound at typical listening levels for speech. So we typical speech doesn't have a whole lot of low, low end, um, content. So this frequency weighting will um, will kind of diminish the effects of low frequency noise and sound and and um, really focuses on how we hear speech. So this 35 dBA is a maximum and it is influenced predominantly by mechanical and um, MEP systems and building services. It's also uh, can be controlled by the outdoor, uh, the exterior envelope of the space. So if we think about Chicago, uh, on the bottom left of the group of images, there's a image of the noise, of a noise map of Chicago. You can really see two predominant lines um, where we have flight paths for O'Hare and the other for Midway, but we also have the L as well. And lots of schools are either under these flight paths or are close to the L, there's sirens. Um, you know, we live in a busy city here in Chicago, so there's a lot going on. And so that, that envelope of the building is really critical in order to keep sound from outside, um, from getting into the classroom and, and creating a uh, information masking um, as the teacher is talking. You know, it's also playground noises, people playing outside. Um, you know, a if you have heard a, a squeaky swing uh, and all you're thinking about is, I want to go to recess, when's recess? You know, it's hard to focus on what the teacher is saying. And um, the other aspect that, that the standard really talks about and focuses on is is the reverberation time. And so at its most basic level, uh, the mid-frequency reverberation time uh, is set at a maximum of 0 0.6 seconds. So this is really influenced by finished choices. Uh, also volume of the classroom and, and furniture choices. So it's about reflective surfaces versus more absorptive surfaces. If you think about um, you know, the hardness um, and and really how that can affect reflections throughout the space. So part of, uh, I'm gonna share some of the research, some results from the research that I was a part of. Um, these two graphs show measurements of both the unoccupied background noise level and reverberation time. They're histograms, so it shows um, number of classrooms on the y-axis. And then the x-axis is those metrics, so either the background noise level or the reverberation time. 
And what we found was in a measurement or in a measure of all 220 classrooms over five districts in Nebraska and Iowa, comprised of third, fifth, eighth, and 11th grade classrooms, um, these measurements indicated that, that reverberation time goals were met more of the time, so 85% of the time. And then really we see that, that any time it was exceeded, the 0 0.6 seconds was exceeded, no classroom out of the 220 was greater than uh, 0 0.85 seconds, which is much closer to, to our recommendations um, compared to what we saw with the background noise level. So only 9% only of classrooms out of 220 um, were meeting this background noise level requirement of 35 dBA. And, and the levels that we saw when, when they weren't meeting the standard were sometimes up to 53 dBA. That is a lot when you're thinking about how, how speech is, uh, uh, how we learn. We're learning through this communication between a teacher and, and a student. And so when we have that masked, it's very difficult. Um, so this is just an idea and a sample, but hopefully it gives some perspective on, on what we can do and where we need to improve. So um, we'll start with, with background noise levels and, and talking about what we can do. So MEP systems are the main contributors. Um, one of the things that we can do as members of the design team is, is allow for sufficient duct sizes, allow for buffer spaces. Um, we don't want to put fans and equipment inside the classrooms. Um, but duct work that is, that is appropriate for the velocity, um, it is appropriate for a, a distance. You don't want to have equipment right next to where your outlet is. Um, so we need to locate the mechanical rooms as far away from possible from the quiet learning spaces. And we like using ducted air handling units um, from remote locations. Um, I know that this audience is mostly architects and not mechanical engineers, but, but architects and other design team members have an opportunity to advocate for appropriate mechanical designs and really uh, plan for, for sufficient space for these quiet systems. So you can see in the image on the right here that one of the things that we like to do is run the ductwork in corridors. So it's overhead, but in less sensitive spaces where there isn't uh, typically instruction happening. And then we branch off into each of the learning spaces individually from those main trunks. Um, this helps you know, add some distance from the equipment itself, but it also helps in terms of, of not um, of flanking paths, of creating a, an opportunity for sound to just enter the duct and then go over into the next classroom. Um, so when we do this, this does require some level of, of additional floor height, floor to floor height, or you know, more than if you were just running one duct in the over all of the classrooms. Um, and so when when we get into, if we start out with this kind of design in SD, sometimes the first round of, of pricing comes back and, and there are VE efforts. And when an easy place to, to reduce the budget is reducing the, the floor to floor height of each of the floors, um, this can have an impact on, on mechanical noise. Uh, it's not always something that we're thinking about and it and it doesn't have to be to the detriment of, of learning, but it's it's that this is all really interconnected. Um, and, and these choices have an impact. Another choice that has an impact is um, with partitions and glazing. So partitions, we, we would like to run walls from the structural deck um, below all the way to the structural deck above. Uh, where we avoid partial height walls separating classrooms. Uh, the standard does not include noise from the adjacent classroom from occupants, 
Um, but it's really something that we should be mindful of because if you if you have these partial height ceilings without enough mass to to prevent sound transfer into the next room, you are going to have informational masking and and increased background noise level. Um, the other thing is that we're seeing a lot more transparency, both into the interior portions of the building and to the exterior. So appropriate detailing at mullions is, is always critical. Um, finding out how you can get a tight seal that performs as well as the wall that, that is uh, separating these adjacent spaces. Um, and, and there are different levels of robustness of, of glazing. If if the school is right under O'Hare uh, flight paths or midway flight paths, there is a different level of glazing that may be appropriate to, to ensure that you don't have um, the, the jet engine noise uh, masking instruction. Um, there are many studies that, are, that have been showing that that, that noise is detrimental to, to learning and to, um, to different levels of uh, and measures of health. So thinking about that in those situations. Um, the other thing that we can do is in isolation um, planning buffer spaces. So corridors, we can really be thoughtful in where corridors occur and where mechanical rooms are. So putting a mechanical room right next to a classroom um, may not be the best strategy unless you build a, a really robust construction um, that, that separates those two spaces. Um, but you can separate uh, loud, noisy environments like music rooms um, that can go across a hallway or, or you can put storage rooms between classrooms or between music spaces and classrooms. But there's, um, there's a lot that can be done even before we pick out partition assemblies in just thinking about how space is arranged. One other thing that we can think about, um, we're, we're seeing more open plan classrooms. Um, some of the pedagogy that is happening uh, that's, that's popular these days emphasizes this collaborative environment. Um, we love collaboration, uh, but, but there are ways that we can, that we can do this that are potentially more effective than others. So we're we're not recommending open plan learning environments, but but if you do want them and need to do them, uh, we can think about how how the space is configured and how walls can be used to break up to break up sound. So in this case, you can see here on the left that that it looks like there is a continuous wall there. So that's looking kind of at the middle of the if you look at the middle plan drawing, you can see that there is a path that that wall is not completely continuous, but we have obscured the line of sight so that if sound does kind of get through there, there's also absorption on the back sides of those panels, but it's not coming through. Um, it's not the same as if we only had that par partial height partition. Um, it's not just going up and over completely. It really has to, to travel a ways um, to get to the other side. Um, one other thing, or moving from kind of background noise level isolation uh, into reverberation time. Um, so we saw that many classrooms meet the ANSI standard, um, but developing trends may call for aesthetic approaches that deviate from the most common absorptive treatments. Um, one rule of thumb is to install sound absorbing material equal in area to approximately the floor area. Um, so this doesn't have to all be on the ceiling. Uh, we can put wall panels. Um, we can use a mix of wall panels and ceiling. Uh, absorption. And really, we do want to still ensure sound reflecting surfaces in the middle of the ceiling and wall surface nearest to the source to provide some of those beneficial early first order reflections, um, as Alejandro was, was talking about as well. It, it becomes more complicated as the rooms shift from an orientation or a more fixed orientation like we're seeing here um, into that more um, flexible sort of classroom. But 
providing a mix of absorption and reflective surfaces is key for vocal fatigue for the teacher, but also to make sure that students are receiving additional reflections. Um, so when you use wall panels, they can be most beneficial from three to seven feet above the finished floor um, where sound can build up from occupants. Uh, but also you don't want to put it everywhere on the walls because then you won't necessarily get those beneficial reflections. Um, so there are many, many choices and looks available for absorption these days in acoustic treatments. There's a variety of colors, of shapes, scales, and price points. Um, and so here are some examples. We have traditional ACT ceilings. Um, we have a wall with tectum hexagons that you know, now these shapes and you can do these tessellations of these panels to create some interesting um, aesthetics as well. We can do something as simple as a K13 or a, a cellulose type spray, um, uh, especially in surfaces like in cafeteria environments or, or other noisy spaces where you wanna keep those uh, reverberation times lower. Um, and there are many more custom solutions as well. So these photos in the library show a GFRG panel that has been um, designed and there's absorption behind it. So it provides both a bit of reflection and, um, and absorption as well. So you, you don't have to hire an acoustics consultant every time. And, and I hope that, um, that we're, we're providing you with the information that you need to, to look at the resources that are available in terms of the ANSI standard. Um, but, but you all as architects, we as design team members, uh, it, it can be very useful to collaborate as early as possible if, if an acoustician is involved, um, because many of the aspects that we discussed are, are controlled by adequate, adequate space for quiet mechanical systems, appropriate partitions and building envelope, um, and, and really building layout to ensure appropriate buffer spaces. So uh, when we were looking at the two graphs of reverberation times measured in the classroom versus the background noise level, Finished choices are very easy or much easier to add at a later time than, than redoing mechanical systems. So the earlier that, that you're thinking about these things and that someone is involved, the easier it is for us to, to get it right the first time and um, be good stewards of our the available resources of the school districts. Uh, so our standard in this country provides guidelines it's not enforceable. Um, lead and well are, are some um, uh, programs that, that do provide some level of requirements. They're opt-in systems. Um, and sometimes the minimum requirements are not always the ANSI minimum recommendations, but it's, it's a step in the right direction, especially in terms of being able to, to point to something and say, we need to meet it. Um, so. I'm going to hand it over to Mike to to talk a little bit more. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Alejandra. I know we just got a couple minutes left. I want to go through a couple quick takeaways uh, that we want everybody to leave with. Has changed dynamics of the classroom. Um, it's been it's been successful and improved the way students learn. We don't want to go back to traditional learning, um, but we we do know we need to look at the noise sources within the classrooms, adjacent spaces, and external background noises that Laura and Alejandro talked about. We need to take those into consideration when designing our schools. Um, by by creating more equitable equitable spaces, better acoustical design um, will help students with hearing loss and will also help at risk students. But it also benefits students without hearing loss. It benefits students that aren't at risk. It benefits teachers, paras, volunteers, anybody, any users that are space. So um, like we said, some of the benefits to it is getting rid of those negative that come from the noise, such as the annoyance, sleep disturbance, stress, hypertension. Um, getting, rid of, getting rid of that background noise and getting better acoustics in the classroom actually improves students' ability to communicate, engage, and to learn, which Ultimately, that's what we're trying to design in these spaces. Um, at the beginning of the project, um, 
another, another takeaway is at the beginning of the project, when project goals are being established, discuss this acoustical design and its importance with your project team and the client. Make the school district aware of the issues with poor acoustics. They may not be aware. They may not have set through a, a, a one to learn like this. Um, talk to them about it. This is the time at the beginning of the project to make acoustics a project goal and to get it into the budget. If the school district has an educational audiologist, bring them on board. They will be one of your biggest advocates to help you with the project. As you're doing uh, user interviews or department interviews during SD and DDs, don't just ask them about the office space they need. Loop them into the overall design of the project. Um, as, as Laura just mentioned, classroom finishes help with uh, the reverberation. But don't forget to look at the background noises and how those can be mitigated. Look at how windows are detailed exter um, for external noises. Talk to your mechanical engineer early in the process. Uh, nobody wants that giant boxcar unit that's sitting up on the roof to be visible from the front, uh, you know, your main view of the school. So figure out where that can go and then put early in the process and then you might be able to figure out, okay, let's put it somewhere. Let's your floor plan might need to be adjusted to where that goes. Maybe it goes above locker rooms, toilet rooms. Uh, maybe it goes above a kitchen or something like that. But have that conversation early on and make sure everyone is on the same page. Uh, discuss project goals for acoustics and background noise with the client, the design and implement your consultants and the contractor. Make sure everyone knows what the performance expectations of the classroom acoustics are supposed to be and what the background noise level is, whether they're following ASHRAE or ANSI. Um, I also recommend making sure that the people that are doing your CA for the project, make sure that they know what the goals are because if substitutions are meet, being made during construction, that can also affect that performance. So we don't wanna make something, a, a change being made there. So just real quick, um, I know for this, we focused on K-12 and we focused on the classroom spaces. There are other spaces out there. I think we've all you know, been involved with the performing arts spaces and the music classrooms, but there's also the cafeterias. Acoustic design can help reinforce desired environments that you have within that space. And then also acoustics can help those spaces be used for others. This was actually an alternative uh, cafeteria that we wanted more intimate. So it was darker colors, lower ceiling, um, but also looking at the other spaces. As schools expand their offerings outside the typical classrooms, there are more spaces to consider. Need to think about. Oops, sorry about that. Need to think about the noise that's being made in these classrooms, in addition to the classrooms. Whether it's the uh, humming and whirring that might be coming from different equipment and machinery, uh, clanking noises that can come from tools and the utensils being used in culinary, or even the loud noise and uh, clanging machinery and fitness. Even students being loud talking over. Advocate for acoustic design so that you can help these spaces so that people aren't going home um, with the headaches and with the other issues. Also, because of the things we mentioned about um, students that are younger or more vulnerable, we didn't focus on higher ed, but that's also something, please consider these when you're designing your higher ed spaces too. So I know we're trying to wrap all that up um, quickly, but wanted to try to give a little bit of time for Q&A if somebody has some questions. And I can help with this part here. Um, some of these we have talked about, so I'll just read through them kind of quickly. Um, we have a question on open design for schools and any suggestions where you don't have walls that go to the ceiling for these partitions. I think, Laura, you touched on this a little bit. Do you want to just add a, a point on that? Uh, yeah, sure. If this is a if this is a renovation, um, things become more challenging, but if, if this is in design, um, it's really about providing uh, uh, convoluted paths for sound to be traveling through. So um, keeping that that exposed, uh, the exposed height of the wall, like obscuring that in some way. Um, I'll, I see that we have more questions, so I'll- yep. The yeah, I, I think also. Oh, go ahead, Michael. As I was saying, it also it seems like open classroom, uh, open plan goes in and out of favor. Um, mm -hmm. If the school district is pushing you to do it, then doing the methods that Laura talked about, I, I think, are great. Um, I think one way is also to try to just get away, get away from it. Yep. Okay. The second question: Will VRF systems help with the mechanical noises? They can they can, but also you 
typically have more units that, that are serving um, individual spaces um, or a single unit serving each space. So that requires more space um, above the, or in the corridor. Um, and it's it's a lot of coordination with building height and, and making sure that you just have adequate space. Those units can be pretty quiet, so, so it does help, but we don't want to put them in the classrooms. Um, so you need adequate space to get them out of the classrooms, and it's, it's just a coordination effort. Okay, another question. Can you discuss active sound control systems for addressing classroom acoustics? Uh, if that's meant to be active sound control, um, I'm not sure if that's amplified systems or if, if active sound control is a, a sound masking system. Um, that's what I'm thinking, maybe, yep. Sound masking. Yep. So sound masking is something that we that we really want to avoid um, at all costs in in classrooms and learning environments because we we want to decrease that that noise. Um, and so active sound control can help in terms of if your if your partitions are are not robust or not um, you don't have a high SDC level between like offices, that kind of thing can help. But when we're talking about classrooms, we don't wanna add noise to the room. Yeah, one of the, yeah, so that, that's that masking of it. Um, I also wanted to bring up just the idea, um, I know some people think of the idea of, um, there, there's the systems that have the speakers around the classroom and the teacher has the microphone and this is just helping more students, more than just the students who have the, the phone X system that Alejandro was talking about. Um, that can actually cause problems for younger students who are developing because it it's not it's not helping, Alejandro can probably explain this better, but the way that they're able to um, understand where the sound is coming from and, and get that part of their brain to mature, that when the sound is coming from all over, there, it causes different issues with that. So. There's also, and then also as they move to other classrooms, that's not helping them if, if it's not set up all the way throughout the school. Yeah, thank you, Michael. That's exactly, that's that's a good way to put it, but sound field systems, they're called, and and they can be, I mean, if, if none of the design approaches can manage background noise, and this is a way to go about it, so, the sound field system will enhance the teacher's um, speech and bring, you know, the teacher doesn't have to, to raise her voice or his voice, and then the students will hear it at a higher intensity. But then again, you know, it's placed in one, in one room. It could be moved around. The new systems are more flexible for that, but, but yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's a difference. I mean, you're adding... It, it is it is nice uh, to give an assistance to the teacher's voice from the standpoint that I think teachers have to speak at 10 to 15 decibels above what what the volume level is in the classroom. And as Laura was showing, that volume level can be really high in some of these classrooms, especially as you start to look at the Lombard effect and, and people just start talking loud. So now you have teachers who have strained voices going um, going home with, you know, losing their voice at the end of the day. Um, but again, that so the, the sound field system, I think, helps them more than it helps the students because I think it, it might also be better um, at the higher ed level because those students have their their brains and their auditory systems have developed more than you know a fifth graders. Okay, and just last question: We are over one o'clock. Um, is there anything you can do to existing HVAC systems to help improve the acoustics? Um, one thing is where we start is is asking for them to be um, rebalanced. You can start there because sometimes old systems have just kind of gotten out of whack. And, and so that can be a, a good place to start. Um, if it's window units, like um, uh, unit ventilators, Letters. yep, then um, there are some uh, methods of, of attenuation that you can kind of add to that system. Um, kind of on top of it to to convolute the path of the air and and sound. Um, 
but all of this really depends on if there's enough um, pressure in the system. And I think it also depends on how much of the school needs right. it. If it's a small area, then maybe some uh, uh, duct lining or duct lagging yep. um, can be done or screwing out some of the duct work for some flex duct. It, you would want to talk to an ME uh, mechanical engineer <laughs> to me. Yeah. Um, but th there are possibilities for retrofitting. It's just, you know, coming into the, into the cost of it too. Mm -hmm. All right. Any final comments before we wrap up here? Thank you so much, Laura, Mike, and Alejandra. We really appreciate your bringing your expertise and your ideas to the table here. Um, just a note to everyone, um, this was our first event for, for the year, 2023, for our Education KC, and we'll have more tours and events, and we have our upcoming quarterly meeting on April 5th. So thank you for joining us. Thank, thank you, you everybody. Thank you, everybody. Bye.